All right, so I'm not even going to lie to y'all. I'm hoping that this video will ingratiate me to the women folk because despite my booming bass baritone and beautiful bald head, my gender analytics look like an Overwatch matchmaking lobby. Believe me, if you haven't been in one, it's pretty much what you would have if you could bottle, scare the maiden's energy and sell it. Why you would do that, I don't really know but my point is ladies this one is for y'all specifically because it's something that both i and plenty of other black folks men and women and non-binaries alike have been hearing about a particular kind of black man for practically ever to the point that kanye in his pre-problematic phase wrote a whole verse about it and when he get on he leave your ass for a white girl why do some emphasis on some black men assume their success overrules their blackness now understand something i'm not saying that this is at all exclusive to men because i mean zoe zaldana is right there but what i am saying is it feels like every other year there's another prominent cock owner of color disavowing their blackness in one way shape or form morgan freeman shameek moore Smokey the Bear, and even every YouTube University grad's favorite professor, Kanye of Westeros, have all in some way, shape, or form dismissed the systemic discrimination experienced by black folks for <laughs> just being black folks. Matter of fact, I wouldn't have even made this video if it weren't for Idris Elba dropping that don't call me a black actor, Jim, a little while ago. Like, nigga, what do you want me to call you, Obsidian? And I won't do that because that's colorist. But it is interesting to me that this phenomenon is not limited to celebrities. So, I mean, if we're going to keep it a buck, they don't live in the real world anyway. But the data seems to suggest that black men are more susceptible to sipping the conservative Kool-Aid than black women are. Now, before y'all do one of either flood my comments with just a bunch of different ways of saying not all black men or conversely, cross your legs, snap your fingers and roll your necks in agreement. This is a very small percentage of folk that I'm talking about, like Puff Daddy's teeth small. And yeah, I know that that was mean spirited, but that bit will never not be funny to me. Black men still overwhelmingly vote Democrat, if for no reason than out of principle, as well as we overwhelmingly marry black women. We also overwhelmingly consider blackness an important part of our identity and all that other stuff that y'all say that we don't do because evidently the only black dudes that a lot of y'all have ever actually interact with either have this hairline or this guy as their lock screen but again it can't be ignored the disparity between black men and women who go colorblind at some point in life and that's what i want to unpack today why are black men statistically more susceptible to adopting a raciality than black women are. Well, I mean, aside from this, obviously. I said I like women. Women, women, women. <laughs> so I think the first thing we have to understand and acknowledge is that black women have always, always been on the front lines of every progressive socio-political movement. Reason being the intersectionality of oppressions they have experienced historically. I've talked about this at length in the past, so I'm not going to dwell here. But statistically speaking, again, black and indigenous women are the most vulnerable demographics in terms of financial and physical wellness. Black women have also been historically left holding the bag whenever their non-POC and or non-women allies got a taste of the privilege they were pushing for all along. The betrayal of black women by white allies during the first and second waves of modern feminism is what led to people like Bell Hooks, Patricia Collins, and Kimberly Crenshaw 
emphasizing the importance of not just women's liberation, but black women's liberation. Meaning that special attention needed to be given to the convergence of injustices black women experienced based on both race and gender and not one or the other. This is what intersectionality is, folks, and it is the foundation of black feminism. See, the more injustices you're forced to endure, the more likely you are to just say F the whole system as opposed to trying to fix or operate within it. Well, I mean, unless you're Ebony Williams. This is why both the civil rights and black power movements were propelled forward by women, despite those movements becoming basically synonymous with their male figureheads. The point that I'm getting at is historically, at least, black women are more likely to adopt a more radical politic than that of black men if based on nothing but the greater weight of injustice black women have had to endure historically black women also historically despite always having a pretty high presence in the workforce have been denied access to power within their own households when a man is present and that right there i think is the key thing folks we black men still have even if admittedly marginal access to power within the current social framework based on (laughs) us being men. Thus, the goal for a lot of men isn't to dismantle the social framework, but to find a way to get around the roadblocks put in between us and full access to power. Black women are just more likely to reserve themselves to the reality that they will (laughs) never have that access because there's always somebody in their racial gender or socioeconomic circle who has greater access due to factors beyond their immediate control i.e race and gender so long story short a lot of black men want access to power and to his corresponding privilege in the same way that a lot of white women just want access to the power and privilege that comes with having a dick This isn't to say that women of color don't want that also. I mean, again, Ebony Williams. It just means they understand how unrealistic a task that would be. Now, it's real easy to jump down the collective throats of black men for not holding the ladies down. But like I said in this video, black men were taught from the time we touched down in Jamestown that the job of a man is to protect and to provide but also we were simultaneously denied the ability to do just that thus it caused us to develop a penchant for both hyper and toxic masculinity the former being the over exaggeration of traditionally male traits and the latter being the over emphasis on the importance of traditionally male traits masculinity equals power in our society thus if you can access that then you pretty much hit pay dirt bucko so what a lot of us are attempting to do even if we don't realize it is to attain the white man's standard of masculinity while also being denied the tools to achieve that namely wealth so Fixing the A-raciality problem, I think, starts with dismantling our preconceived idea of what manhood actually is to begin with. But that's another video that apparently I'm going to wind up doing next, probably. But my point is, black men saw a formula and logically assumed that if we followed it, we would get the same results. But it don't work like that. See, the problem with this formula is that it doesn't account for just how anti-black our society is. Like, it's literally the reason this country exists in the first place. I mean, I've done a bunch of videos about that already. As a black man, you can literally do everything the right way. Make yourself as palatable to mainstream sensibilities as possible, and you're still just one heat of the moment gaff away from most of your upcoming projects being canned. A 10 year ban from the same academy that averages like three sex offenders per award category, and your name just being besmirched across the entertainment industry. 
like I really don't think y'all remember how visceral the initial reaction to Slapgate was. Like it was so bad that people who had nothing to do with the incident were apologizing on behalf of the entire black delegation. And again, we don't have an emperor. Well, we didn't have an emperor. The closest thing that we got was Marcus Garvey about a hundred years ago. And I mean, you can't say that he didn't understand the assignment. See, one of the reasons I get so irked with the way that the public treats black celebrities is that anytime one of these niggas does or says something suspect is never treated as an isolated instance. It's almost always treated as representative of the culture as a whole, which is wild because how long did it take white celebrities to start talking publicly about the casting couch culture that was so ubiquitous in Hollywood that is literally a subgenre on smut sites? And this, folks, is what pisses me off about prominent black men positioning themselves above their race. It don't work like that for you, bucko. And if you don't believe me, let a white woman call the police on you. I can all but guarantee that that Emmy won't stop an arrest warrant. Now, saying all of this, I want y'all again to understand that this is a very small minority of folk that we're talking about here. In fact, at least based on admittedly anecdotal evidence, it appears to me that black men who experience the most dramatic upward socioeconomic movement tend to be the most susceptible to buying into the wealth as worthiness narrative that breeds a racial attitudes. Let me use two men who couldn't come from more different socioeconomic backgrounds to elaborate on my point. They said they never gave you niggas money. You don't know how to appreciate shit. Okay, so when I was a middle and high schooler, it was just generally accepted that Dave Chappelle was from Washington, D.C. But saying that is like saying that Kobe was from Philly, which I guess, yeah, sure, if you're not from around these parts, then go ahead and nobody except like the most insecure of Philly niggas is going to have a problem with that. But no one, Kobe included, was really pushing that until the whole Mamba mentality rebrand was in full effect. Technically... Kobe is not from Philly. And yeah, I am aware of how that sounds from somebody who's technically from Jersey, but where I grew up is basically the Philly, what Yonkers is to the five boroughs. Or maybe Camden is Yonkers and Trenton is like New Rochelle or something. I don't know. My point is Kobe is actually from Lower Marion Township, which is a, about as far far a drive from center city is camden is but that's not really important what is important is that lower marion is two things that trenton hasn't been since this portrait was breaking news very affluent and very very white the reason i bring that up is kids like me who did grow up black working class especially those of us who grew up in the Philadelphia metro area gravitated more toward Allen Iverson despite he not being from here because he looked sounded and presented himself like one of our uncles or dads or whatever he had the tattoos the cornrows wore a do-rag over his cornrows wore a fitted on top of his do-rag over his cornrows like, all he needed was some Thames, a throwback, and a rock aware parka, and he would be, like, halfway to the Rap City basement booth and a parole hearing. In fact, it was that unapologetic swagger and the backlash he received because of it that made Iverson so beloved by black folk the country over, honestly. It's a weird thing where... Even when we know you're wrong, because Lord knows AI had more than his share of faults, and I will be doing that video soon. Once we see white folks start pulling out the noose and pitchforks, the ghost of ancestors past just descend from black heaven and whisper to us in a still small voice, avenge me, nigga. This is why even today you'll get a lot of old heads who still cape for people like Farrakhan, despite knowing how problematic Farrakhan and a lot of stuff he said is and please Minister Farrakhan do not send your goons after me I'm sorry I even brought you up matter of fact Clarence cut this
And that was the uphill battle that Dave faced when breaking into the comedy scene. Because, you see, Dave is not actually from D.C. He's from Silver Springs, a pretty well-off suburb of D.C., enough to the point that it's regularly listed as one of both the best and most expensive places to live in the state of Maryland. Now, to his credit, since his audience has become just as, if not more white than black, so it doesn't really matter anymore anyway, Dave has been more transparent about his background, even using it as material for one of his Netflix sets. But even then, he makes it sound like he grew up house poor. And I'm not going to sit here and assume to know the finances of his household, especially after his parents split. But I mean, nigga, not only were both of his parents college professors, but his dad was the dean of Antioch College, the same Antioch College located in that upper middle class, lily white hippie suburb that he lives in today. And his mom, who would later found one of the first black studies doctoral programs in the U.S., was a former government official for Patrice frickin' Lumumba. Like, it's kind of hard for me to believe that with that kind of pedigree that you grew up eating cornflakes with tap water every night. Now listen, I know this sounds like I'm throwing shade at Dave for not growing up poor, but I'm not saying that him being not poor disqualifies his blackness like that would actually contradict the whole point of this video and is actually pretty racist what i'm doing is the opposite here because understanding dave's background can better contextualize the person he would become once he did hit it big what y'all gotta remember is before Chappelle's show dave spent the 90s cutting his teeth on that decade's equivalent of the chitlin circuit and even wound up receiving the infamous apollo theater treatment before eventually making his name through explicitly black platforms like deaf comedy jam this he would then leverage into several roles of varying visibility in some of the best loved black comedies of the 90s and early aughts and also Blue Streak. My point is, Dave built an audience for himself using material based on an experience that wasn't necessarily his own until he made it so. Just like, insert gangster rapper here. Again, he was never forced to live at the crossroads of racism and rent pass due until he left his middle class suburban bubble and moved to New York. So when you see characters like Tyrone Biggums and Tron, the friendly neighborhood street hustler on Chappelle show, these aren't characters that shaped Dave's lens growing up. At best, their observations he made after that lens was for the most part already shaped. Now, what's the purpose of me bringing all this up? Well, it's that by the time that Dave had become famous enough that suburban white kids were using I'm rich bitch as their yearbook quote, he no longer needed that core black audience to drive his career. And thus it became easier for him to disconnect from that black audience. Now I'm not going to do the whole, well, I knew that Dave was cooked before it was cool thing because I don't really think that he is. I just think that he's being lazy and strong stubbornly transphobic but i will say that the first thing that tipped me off to dave's disconnect wasn't the closer but it was actually sticks and stones he didn't do anything that you can call the police for i dare to try call the police on him hello police yes i am i am on the other line with comedian louis ck and i think that he is masturbating while i'm on the phone you know what the police are gonna say in atlanta well, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They ruined this nigga's life, and now he's coming back playing comedy clubs, and they acting like if he's able to do that, that's going to hurt women. See, white folks, most people didn't know who Louis C.K. was even after the SA stuff came out. And that's because we don't really rock with that kind of lovable loser style of cringe comedy. Not to say that we don't do self deprecation. I mean, people like Kevin Hart and Martin Lawrence and a bunch of others have basically made whole careers doing that, but we don't do it to the level of making the audience question whether the presenter should be put on suicide watch after his set or not. So, why then did Dave? 
takes so much time in his set, sticking his neck out for a nigga most of his longtime audience couldn't tell from Louis Anderson. Well, because Louis is Dave's friend. Matter of fact, a lot of Dave's friends are powerful white men. Something he hasn't been at all shy about sharing in recent years to the point of basically humble bragging and not even humbly bragging, just straight up rubbing it in our faces. The whole set gave me the ick because it just felt like him ranting against all the plebes, black and white and everything in between, making life so much harder for rich and famous folk like he and Louie. And this is what let me know that Dave at this point in both his career and personal life identifies more closely with rich white men than he does the average black Joe. However, despite this, Dave is still very much aware of his blackness and the implications of it. So much that he has now developed a tendency to weaponize it against any and all criticism directed his way. And again, this all comes back to his background. See, Dave growing up in an environment that basically personified black excellence taught him at a young age that no matter how much money you got, you still just a nigga. And the world will not hesitate to remind you that if you ever get foolish enough to think you've outrun you're black. You got more okay. questions, but I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. And that's a point I want to make sure that I make before the end of this video. Blackness is not a monolith. Let me take some time here to shout out Stephanie from Wine and Chill, who actually directed me to this article. But basically what the first part of it says is that most of white America's interaction and therefore understanding of blackness comes through consuming media. Because again, most of y'all don't really rock with us like that until it's time to trot out your one black friend for the company Black History Month program. So because until like 15 or so years ago, y'all treated Boys in the Hood like it was a Nat Geo special, that's what most of y'all imagine when you think of blackness. Thus, many of y'all treating hashtag black excellence as an anomaly, even if it is an outlier, admittedly. See, according to the Pew Research Center, despite black people representing a disproportionate percentage of low income Americans, 47% of us fall somewhere in the middle class range, even if the range of what is considered middle class now is so wide that it's practically meaningless but that's a whole nother video that i have no intention of ever doing additionally 40 percent of black americans describe their environment as suburban as compared to 41 percent who describe it as urban and the 18 percent who describe it as rural so what i'm saying is the black experience is as diverse and varied as wilt chamberlain's body count but the thing <laughs> Okay, let me let me let me let me try that again. <laughs> that was a good one. I'm proud of myself for that. But the thing that ties us all together is the shared experience of oppression, exploitation, and discrimination based on us looking like living chocolate bars. But this doesn't stop a disturbing number of blacks, men in particular from assuming that their personal achievement, or at least the pursuit of it, disqualifies their blackness. Now again, let me preface this portion by saying that the mass exodus of black men to Mount MAGA has and continues to be grossly exaggerated by the mainstream and non-traditional media alike. Just like every other harmful narrative surrounding black men. Except our obsession with malt liquor and loose menthols. That one is actually true. But it should be noted that despite black men overwhelmingly voting Democrat since basically realignment nearly 100 years ago at like a 8 to 2 clip no less, black men are about twice as likely to vote conservative as black women are. In 2016, 14% of black men voted for Trump as compared to 6% of black women. And in 2020, 12% of black men voted for the then incumbent as compared to 5% of black women. 
Now, again, I want to emphasize white people that this is a very, very small portion of the black electorate, especially when compared to white folks. Need I remind y'all, it was white women who won Trump the White House in 2016 and kept him competitive in the next election. My point being, if Trump was ever going to be reelected, it wasn't going to be us that did it. But it was y'all's country yokel cousins who make the welfare will go round that was going to do that. So please spare me the pearl clutching over niggas like Charleston White and Candace can't find a decent hairdresser because for every one of them, I promise you, I can go down to the nearest Superstore USA and find like 10 Laura Ingrams. And they all have the same goofy ass lob cut. But still, we got to ask ourselves, why is there such a disparity between black men and women when it comes to conservatism? Well, let's talk about Ice Cube and Wheezy for a second. To their credit, they are examples of men who managed to defy the odds stacked against them and attain fiscal elitism. They are, in their own minds at least, self-made men. The pinnacle of the rugged hyper individualism that characterizes American society, black, white, and everything in between. Wheezy and especially Q being a Gen Xer are not at all unique among black men in their admiration of other successful and wealthy men, regardless of color. I've said this before, but if it weren't for racism, I would bet my ball sack that most of the men in my family would at least lean Republican. And that's because most of us have been conditioned with a sort of admiring envy of white masculinity. We want the access to hegemonic manhood that the whites have, but without having to sacrifice any of the latent swag that stops us from tucking our short sleeve button up shirts into a pair of Wrangler jeans. And that's practically speaking what Wheezy Cube, Curtis, Ye, Kodak, and any other rich and famous black man who has vocalized their support or at least alliance with conservatives or conservative ideals want access to power. The purpose of movements like Black Hebrew Israelites, Five Percenters, the NOI, and pretty much any other conservative black identity movement is opening the avenues of power up to black people, specifically men within the current social framework. This is in opposition to movements like Black Power and Black Lives Matter, not to be confused with the grift that is the BLM Global Network, by the way which purposes were and are to dismantle the very frameworks that create this power dynamic that we are experiencing today. This is pretty much the whole point of black capitalism and I'm not going to dwell because I spent a whole like hour talking about and debunking it. But at the end of the day, what black capitalism boils down to is the reclamation of power that we never really had in the first place from white people through the accumulation of both liquid and non-liquid capital, which I've already said is literally impossible without reparations. So yeah, your Amazon store ain't the answer to black liberation, bucko. But again, it's really easy to get laser focused on the dealings of celebrities because duh. But let's not let the head assery of a few powerful black men color our perception of that entire demographic. And see, folks, this is why sex work matters. Well, it's interesting because usually the starkest differences in voting patterns are along racial and educational lines. I mean, that's literally what won Trump the presidency in the first place. But here's the funny thing about black men who voted for Dolan in 2020. There wasn't really that big a divide in educational backgrounds of the 52% of black male conservatives who did vote for Trump with only six percentage points separating advanced degree holders from high school diplomas or less. So we can't really blame education or a lack thereof for this goofiness. But diving a little deeper into the numbers might give us a better set of clues to work with. According to the Pew Research Center again, black conservatives like their white peers 
trend toward both the lower income bracket and half of the country. Additionally, black conservatives are less likely than black Democrats to attend a historically black denomination, 22 to 34%. Now, that might not matter to a lot of y'all who didn't watch any of my black spirituality content, but for those of y'all who have, and especially those of y'all who did grow up in a historically black denomination like myself, you kind of already know why that's kind of a big deal. Since, I mean, church is kind of the reason why most conservatives say that they're conservative in the first place. Or I mean, at least that's the excuse they use, even though most of them probably haven't cracked open the Bible since the Bush administration. The one before Clinton. But that stat will matter more when I tell you that only 58% of black conservatives consider their blackness a, quote, very or extremely important part of their identity as compared to 74% of black Democrats. Perhaps more importantly, 22% of black conservatives say that blackness is, quote, not very or at all important to their identities. All of this is in addition to black Republicans seeing racism as more of individual than systemic issue and also being less likely to consider race an obstacle to upward socioeconomic mobility. What this means is a not insignificant portion of black conservatives, and I mean, if we're going to be real here, black liberals and leftists also see themselves as a racial and thus having access to the same privileges their white peers do, or more accurately and importantly, denial of it. Like I said earlier, access to privilege is what's led to black men creating and adopting a number of different socio-political identity movements designed to get that access outside of whiteness. But it's also caused a lot of black men to attempt to access privilege by accessing whiteness first, or at least making themselves as appealing and or non-threatening to whiteness as to be granted that access. Which now, unfortunately, brings me to Chris Rock. Keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth! I'm going to, okay? See, here's the thing that frustrates me about Chris. is Unlike Dave, he did grow up smack dab at the intersection of Blackness Boulevard and Poor People Alley, to the point of it literally being satirized on network television. But then again, we gotta remember, as comical as the race-based abuse he endured during the busing period was made out to be, things got so bad for him that his parents eventually pulled him out of that predominantly white high school for him to go to one closer to home before he eventually just dropped out altogether and as someone who has talked about the impact bullying has had on my life even as a grown man now I can't not assume that that didn't impact Chris in his adulthood what I mean is I wouldn't be surprised if Chris tried in one way or another to ingratiate himself to the white bullies who tormented him since fighting back probably wasn't a realistic option unless lynching was also one like don't don't get me wrong here i like cr's work or at least i i like parts of it but i'm not going to sit here and lie to y'all for me at least his style has always come off as kind of pick me adjacent if that makes sense like, it feels like he's not really telling jokes for black folks. He's more so telling jokes to white folks that makes them feel like they understand blackness after listening. Like, if you don't know what I mean, just pick pretty much any episode of Blackish after the first season or even you people and ask yourself, who the F is this actually meant to be for anyway? I mean, aside from swirly love apologists, that is. If I ever get around to doing a what went wrong with black television video, I'll elaborate further on this. But at some point in like the mid to late aughts, black shows stopped really being for black people with a handful of exceptions like Insecure and now Abbott Elementary. The blackness parts of those shows were dumbed down in a way to be more like 
edutainment for a liberal white audience than anything that really speaks to an explicitly black one. And that's basically been Chris's shtick for over two decades now. Yeah, I know a lot of y'all are going to try to hit me with the, well, comedy is subjective, Billiam, but listen, yeah, it is, but remember, there are people that actually do find Steve Crowder funny despite him, which is why he's able to make a living by grifting fellow future divorcees. There's also folk who still laugh at Trump jokes. Again, that's all SNL was for like five or six years before it fell off a cliff again. I'm not going to lie, I thought The Closer was funny when it came out, but now watching it back, I can't really do much else but cringe at it, and that's because I've changed as a person since then. My point is, comedy, like all art forms, is an expression of the artist's worldview, and thereby their values. And the reason why some art resonates with you and some art doesn't is because you either can or you can't relate to the perspective of the artist who created it. That's the reason why Steve Harvey could always depend on that nice fat Megafest check every year in the event that he failed at stealing roles from objectively better comics and why elderly black Baptists keep his radio show alive. They share his values. I'm not going to lie to you. If you find racist stuff funny in itself with no further context or commentary to justify its use, then nigga, you're just a racist. That's all there is to it. So if you find blackface funny for no other reason than LOL blackface, then yeah, that's a product of your own internalized anti-blackness. Yeah, even if you're black. And the thing with Chris is he's made pretty much a nice living for a pretty long time expressing his own anti-blackness in a way that sounds insightful if you haven't grown up being conditioned for a career in coon catching like myself. He's not racist. Black people are white people. Black people. You know why? Because we hate black people too. Everything white people don't like about black people, black people really don't like about black people. It's like a civil war going on with black people. It's two sides. Black people. There's niggas. The niggas have got to go. All the time black people want to have a good time, and then ass niggas fuck it up. Now, please, 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 please don't take this as me saying, well, I never thought Chris was funny to begin with because bollocks. CB4 and I'm going to get you, sucker, right there. And if you're a sick bastard like me, then you've probably always found Pookie somewhat hilarious in his own crackhead way. But... What I'm trying to get at here is that folks from where I came from didn't really rock with Chris Rock like that. See, I knew him growing up mainly for his guest spots on sitcoms like Fresh Prince and Martin. But I didn't really know too much about his stand-up until I got to college. And when I did start watching his stand-up sets, I began to understand why we never had any of his sets on tape, despite us literally wearing out the film on our copy of Kings of Comedy. I can't really say anything about his early career, but by the time Chris Rock had become Chris Rock, my peoples weren't really watching him unless it was during one of those weekend hood flick marathons when BET didn't just stand for belongs entirely to Tyler. And the reason that was is because he wasn't really for them. He was for a more, shall we say, mainstream audience. If you haven't gathered this already, Chris's whole shtick is built on respectability politics and appealing to folk who abide by that. I don't think it's unfair to call CR Steve Harvey but with cuss words and honestly I don't think that's fair to Steve since his style is just general old black man hates everything and everyone made after 1979 and to be fair to Steve he's not really trying to appeal to white folks it's just that he like most black boomers honestly is very socially conservative to the point that if he weren't black he'd probably be a Fox News host by now. Anyway, back to Chris. I don't want to dump on the man too much because, again, what I try to do is what he actually does, but just in reverse. What I mean is I don't really make jokes or content at all, for that matter, 
with white people in mind. Chris, on the other hand, has made a whole career out of making it safe for white folks who gassed up This Is America like it was the I Have a Dream speech for Gen Z to laugh at nigga jokes. I mean, in his special Bring the Pain, arguably the one that propelled him to superstardom, Chris built his whole set on respectability politics. The one joke in the whole set that anybody remembers, the one that won him two Grammys, by the way, is just him repeating to the audience over and over again that, yeah, I may be black, but I'm not that kind of black. And by that, I mean a nigga. Have you ever been face to face with a police officer and wondered, is he about to kick my ass? <laughs> well, wonder no more. If you follow these easy tips, you'll be fine. First, obey the law. Laws were made for a reason. Think of them as hints. You've heard people say, man, I wouldn't do that shit if I was you. Well, here's some of that shit. Carjacking, armed robbery, arson, selling drugs, buying drugs, stabbing, shooting. You know, you probably won't get your ass kicked if you just use common sense. See, Chris has made his career by ingratiating himself to liberal white audiences who feel like letting this one nigga call them a cracker for an hour is the equivalent of a truth and reconciliation commission. And no white people, it is not. Especially when that nigga spends just as much time reinforcing your anti-blackness by insisting that he's actually one of the good ones, guys. And... That, folks, is why stuff like this gets allowed to happen on his watch. He's the blackest white guy I well, fucking know. And, I'm, and then all the, the negative things we think about black people, this fucker. You're saying I'm a nigga? Yes, you are the nigglest fucking white man <laughs> I have ever... <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, I, I don't think he, he could do that. Uh, See, again, I'm giving Chris the benefit of doubt based on his upbringing, but it's hard for me to see somebody like Dave letting this slide, or at the very least, letting this slide on film, you know? And if he has, don't tell me because it would kill my whole argument, but whatever. And that's because Dave's upbringing made him aware of how inescapable his blackness is. He's only one career killing controversy away from the sky falling on his head, which is why he's now riding that controversy all the way to the bank now, or at least until the people he's riding on stop hating trans people for long enough to remember how racist they are and kick his black behind right back to the casting call for an undercover brother four. Chris, on the other hand, whether consciously or not, acts like he has the B.O.D., despite his blackness because of both his personal behavior and his personal achievement and thus access to the same privileges as his peers so a raciality a lot of people go chris how come you didn't do nothing back how come you didn't do nothing back that night because i got parents that's why because i was raised okay and you know what my parents taught me don't fight in front of white people Oh, brother, this guy fucking sucks. But what privileges are we talking about specifically here? Well, let's go ahead and break this down, shall we? Women, they, they supposed to be, they supposed to be loving us. You feel that? Man. Are you married by chance? Nah, man, I ain't never had a girlfriend. Okay. But what I'm saying, like I said, like I'm team times now. According to hegemonic masculinity, a man must be protector, provider, and priest of his household. Historically, black men have been denied adequate access to providing, which is why black women have historically and currently even had the highest workforce participation rate among all women. Black men have by far the highest rate of unemployment of any demographic for a number of different factors, including mass incarceration, and this doesn't even adjust for low earning income jobs that you'd honestly be better off getting laid off from than collecting unemployment than showing up for work another day. I'm <laughs> speaking from experience, actually. So my point is 50, 60 or more 
years ago, if you were a black man with just one well-paying job, you practically had your pick of the neighborhood pussycats, regardless of how big a dick you were otherwise. Pun originally, but now definitely intended. Okay, so let's keep it a buck here, folks. The only reason a lot of our elders even stayed together was because of financial security. But now marriage rates, though declining among all racial demographics, have experienced the steepest drop among blacks. And you know why? Well, podcasting, that's why. But also, black women now have more earning power than they ever have, and thus are less likely to settle for a prick with a steady paycheck this is part of the reason why the percentage of single men in their 20s and 30s is so high now the ladies just aren't as willing to give up the kitty cat for nothing but a handful of greenbacks anymore or at least most aren't and that's why sex work matters folks my point is the only thing a lot of men have to offer is their money and a lot of those men leverage or at least attempt to leverage that cash into control over their significant other but because the demand for that is at literal historic lows they're now denied the power it would have granted them just a few decades ago that's what this comes down to folks power and the privilege that comes with it and money has pretty much always been the easiest way to access those things i mean look at elon the man not only bought a whole app just to remind us daily of how much of a lame-ass dork he is but he evidently also bought the cure for baldness hit me up elon now, I did my best to avoid using big scary words like capitalism and oh, patriarchy, but pretty much that's what this all boils down to. The black elites and even the not so much as want access to power in one form or another and they see their blackness as a deterrent to that and rightfully so honestly. In a white supremacist society, a black person can never have full access to white privilege because, I mean, duh nigga. No matter how wealthy you become or respectable you are these men see blackness as limiting because their lens frames whiteness as the standard. Thus, when you see Idris Elba or Morgan Freeman express disdain at being labeled a black actor, it reveals their deep-rooted anti-blackness. Black is not excellent as far as they're concerned because they've been conditioned by a white supremacist society to see black as a ceiling. They've been forced to succeed in spite of their blackness, not because of it, despite spending most of their careers playing very culturally black roles. And instead of seeing this as a problem with the way society views blackness, they see it as a problem with blackness itself. And that ain't it, bucko. Listen, as I've said a few times now on this channel, I frankly don't care how black or not you view yourself. I'm not the gatekeeper of blackness, which is a good thing or else I would have kicked logic and Hobson out of the culture a long time ago just for being cornballs. And DJ Wackademics for just being a slimy culture vulturing meatball. But one thing I do take issue with is when you make a career out of performing blackness, but then disavow it when you feel like you don't need to perform blackness anymore to succeed. Or you see an avenue to access something you think is more desirable. So what I'm saying is Idris Elba doesn't have to be a black actor anymore if he doesn't want to. I just hope that he remembers that and keeps that same energy when white folks get tired of his shtick and he has to go crawling back to Tyler Perry for a bit role in Medea runs for president or whatever. Tyler, I swear to God, if you make that movie, nigga,